Yeah. Yeah, old school. That's what I'm talking about. Listen, this ain't for everybody. Some of y'all need to hear this. I know you're in the trenches fighting, but check it out. I'm going to put it down like this so I can help the saints understand. Everything you're going through is all part of the master plan. Or what? You thought because you got saved, everything was going to be peaches and cream? You better wake up, son. Don't nothing come to a sleep but a drink. Faith without work is dead. Read your Bible. You know what it says. He who don't work, don't eat. Blackers don't get fed. Huh, yeah. Jesus said, he who puts his hands to the plow looks back the same ain't fit. Some of y'all ain't been in the church just five minutes and you're about ready to quit. I ain't mad at you. I'm just hitting you with the real. Huh. If you died for me and I was still tripping, now how you think that make you feel? Check this out. Deep game. This here's deep. Huh. Some of y'all ain't sawing nothing but your study trying to reach huh. But after him who was able to possess your father by his glory. Struggles might be part of your testimony, but it ain't the end of the story. Now the point is this was prophesied way back in the day. Choir, sing your hook right here and see if the church can relate. Thank you for having me. I am with you on Can A Player Play? And I thought, okay, this sounds like some real hardcore on um, Washington, D.C. And they call that music again that they play in D.C. I'm like, okay, this is my kind of music. I can get down with that. <laughs> you know, Dr. Nelson, you know, when I came up with the title uh, 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 of this show, you know, people saying, what is this guy really talking about? You know, is he really talking some urban ethnic stuff? But I thought about it, and I said, to me, the real players of this country, I mean, if you think about it, who are the real players of, the, of this country, of, of this world in which we live in? I mean, who are the actual shot callers? Who are the people that could actually touch 
and and cause or make changes in people's lives or who can affect them in a positive way. So I, my thought was those are the players that I was trying to reach, you know, the head of corporations, you know, the presidents, the CEOs, you know, the people such as yourself that, that have a positive message that could affect change. So that's where my head was when I came up with the title of the show. Yeah, and let me tell you something. So I said, okay, am I a player? And then I started saying, okay, yeah, because I do play the game. I'm trying to play the game. Then I added, but I'm doing more than trying to play the game. I'm actually trying to change the rules of the game. Uh, so that I, I am beyond just being the player. I'm also trying to be a game maker. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, those... That you're exactly the type of person that the show actually caters to because you're doing something positive that can affect change that hopefully uh, our listeners can can benefit from and, and move forward to make this a better place. So, um, um, Dr. Nelson, without me rattling off at the mouth, I, I'll give you the floor. Would you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, I am Dr. Claire Nass, as you heard. Um, right now, I am um, what I call a retreaded advocate for change or conjurer of change. And my book, Smart Futures for a Flourishing World, builds on my history as an international development practitioner and um, my role and studies as an engineer, as well as the work I do in the community and as an organizer. My passion is storytelling. And so the book kind of includes some stories, which are some might say fantasy, but for me, I would say stories of the futures I think we ought to be wanting and ought to be trying to shape. And so um, that's why I'm in a nutshell. I'm sort of, a, as you heard, a member of the Ohotu clan, a clan which I'm proud to be maybe the founding member. I think I've found a few people to join. And Ohotu stands for the outliers, heretics, outlaws, troublemakers, and unreasonables who have at some point or another been told that, uh, how to call it, um, think about their going is enough or something, they should sit to one side. <laughs> mm. So this is for people who have been told they're going to be, they're trying to be too much, go and sit aside. The Ohotu clan is those of us who have decided we're not going to do that. We are going to actually try to not just play, but also change the game. Well, you definitely got a, your work cut out for you. I definitely believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, you know, some of my friends say I'm sort of crazy. And um, as I was thinking about it this morning, eh, as I came up with this idea, I also um, on the board of the World Future Study Federation, which is a peak body for the United Nations, of futurists, mostly academic futurists. I think a couple of us are more on the advocate activist side. But um, in writing, I'm an editor of the magazine called Human Futures that they put out. I was writing my piece and I started thinking about the sort of dislocation some of us are feeling right now being on lockdown for so long. I mean, when it first started, we thought it was just like a crisis. You know, it was a big crisis and then it would be over. But now it's like a chronic condition. And so sometimes we wake up with this feeling like, wait a minute, are we still in this? Or are we like, am I still dreaming? Or like, did I wake up? And are, 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 is it over yet? <laughs> you know? And so it's about, the book is about that. It's about helping us to kind of live through this moment of transition, which is not just going to be the one, two years of the COVID pandemic. This is sort of brought us more sharply into focus, but the transition that we're going through as we grapple with all these fantastic technological marvels that we as humans have created and trying to figure out how do we really manage to ride the wave of our genius without drowning um, in this genius. Wow. So tell us a little bit, why did you write your book? I wrote the book Smart Futures for a Flourishing World because for a long time I've been talking about Smart Caribbean, Smart this, Smart Futures. I came up with the phrase Smart Futures 
one day when I was probably wearing a workshop with my crew that does the Caribbean stuff, and um, just quarreling because I couldn't figure out something my phone was doing. And I started saying, everything is smart, you know, smart city, smart car, smart what, smart clothes, smart house, and we're the most dumbest things out here. We're trying to kill ourselves. We, what we need is some smart futures thinking. So that's how the smart futures came up. And I kept on using the phrase. And then when um, I was approached by Changemaker Books, they had heard about me from somebody else. They said, okay, we hear you're one of these people who are always making change. Is there a book in you? And I said, well, maybe, I don't know. I'd like to tell stories, but... I hemmed and hard, and then my best friend said, no, 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 no. You're not going to let this opportunity go by. You, It's time for you to put your ideas on paper and time for you to take your ideas to the world because you've been talking about this for years. And so as somebody who has had the opportunity to travel and speak on different stages, and certainly as we contemplate that Tuesday will be the first ever UN International Day for people of African descent, today is the day against nuclear tests, and I really follow these days. I'm one of the few people who follow these days religiously, right? I, I thought that it was time enough for uh, an island girl that has represents a minority voice in the power structure, but a majority voice in the number of public people structure, to sort of get on the table. And I listened to my hero who taught, you know, if they don't make space for you, bring a folding chair. So my book is my folding chair. I brought my folding chair to the room. And um, so I'm saying, okay, you don't make a seat for me. I'm going to sit down anyway and put my two cents in this thing because we are at a moment of a real uh, crisis or a pregnant pause. We have to make decisions. And the book is about my idea of how do we change enough people's minds that we can turn the ship in the right direction. So it's about paradigm shifts. How do we get people to think differently about the future that they are creating? Because everybody is creating a future of one sort or another. Did you actually come up with a solution for that? Yes, I did. <laughs> because, 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 yes, that, I came up with a solution. Nelson, I think. I think a lot of people in this country, unfortunately, are just stuck on stupid. I, I do. You know, they run up on an obstacle. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest. Think about it. I mean, when they it's run true. up on an obstacle, <laughs> when they run up on an obstacle, you know, 50% of them, they stand there and they ponder that obstacle for hours, days, and days. They ponder that right. obstacle. And, 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 right. And without... Just giving a little thought, well, how do I go over it, under it, around it? They just sitting there looking at it like, oh, wow, what do I do? And I mean, like, oh, man, you only well, got I... a couple choices. To go under it, over it, around yes. it, but get going. Just don't stay there. Right. You're so right. I mean, the question is, a lot of people look at the obstacles as opposed to looking out at the horizon. And I, But I believe in that there's really actually about 10% of people who naturally think the way I do, quite frankly. They're busy at the local level. They're the ones that are trying to, you know, work on environmental issues or prison reform issues or gender issues. They're working on some issue, right? What has happened is that we've been siloed. So very rare do, let's say, the they, they prison reform people speak to the environmental justice people. We don't speak to the gender people. We don't speak to the LGBTQ people. We don't speak to the faith people. I mean, so we're like in our little bubbles and we're thinking, oh, we're doing so well. But really, folks, it's one word and everything is interlocked. You see, the cover of my book has the Mother Earth kind of hugging the earth and her arms are wrapping. And the idea is that if we can just get 11% of us believe that we have in our own way are driving towards the same goal of a smart future where we're trying to meet the global sustainability goals, but we now see ourselves as part of an ecosystem of interlocutory um, energy people, water people, ocean people, food people, and all these other people. If we can get ourselves to see ourselves that way, we can actually make a paradigm shift. And so the book is about, first of all, showing how we got to this sorry past. I spent some time talking about how the Judeo-Christian ethic 
of um, domination and domination of the earth drove our way of thinking of the way of developing our capitalist structure, how um, colonialism and, and slavery, those legacies, created the economic conditions and the rules in which we're now embedded. And therefore, we have to decolonize some of these ideas and be aware that we must decolonize some of these ideas if we are indeed to move ourselves individually and then collectively in the various tribes to which we belong. And so the book kind of imagines the tribes as being, how, does, how is the world organized? Po- politics, civil society private sector, you know, so faith community, the different tribes to which we belong. And we all belong to like 20 different tribes. I mean, based on the ways we define ourselves. And in each and every one of these tribes in which we're playing this game, right, we need to play by the same five rules, the five questions that the five smart futures think. So, and the acronym smells smart. So that's my solution. If you don't have to do a degree, you don't have to do a certification program. Your boss doesn't have to approve this way of thinking. You just have to make a choice to think this way. Wow. I, you know, it sounds wonderful, and it sounds uh, pretty simple to do. I just have the same little thing gnawing at me. It always goes <laughs> back to the, it goes. It just goes back to the politricians, you know. Uh, yes. It, 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 it's the politricians with their different <laughs> philosophies, you know, they, they claim that, you know, they're they're paying attention to, you know, the climate control and and, and the future, but uh, you know, I hear what they're saying, but one way, is it really true? Because if that is the case, how are we where we are today? Well, a large part of our society, as you know, um, certainly in America and the West or the global North is based on capitalism. And those rules were um, written long before you and I were born. And many people who have come and tried to change it have just nibbled at the edges. And even today, you look at the new economic thought movement, um, you know, trying to look at, okay, can we do reinvent cooperatives or can we look at local money or local exchanges? It's still like a clique of people doing it. But I take hope in the fact that 170-something countries agree that the UN Sustainable Development Goals will have these targets. And you're right. Now here comes it. These people go to these conferences and they make these big pronouncements, and then they go back and they don't finance anything, right? Or the experience of the day is that, okay, I have to get reelected. So I have to do what it keeps to keep me in power, and the long-term thinking is not there. And so my approach is really not about trying to get the politicians to do anything. It's about trying to get those of us in civil society, which I call the plural tribe, or given that even capitalists are now beginning to recognize that they can't continue um, using up Mother Earth's resources without um, her paying us back. Hence, we're getting paid back, you know, if it's not wildfires, if it's not tornadoes, if it's not hurricanes. She's saying, okay, I've been telling you guys, you know, you got to kind of calm down, sit still, and take care of me, your mother, and we're not doing that. So we're paying the price. And even people who are diehard, let's say, money makers first, I call those the merchant tribe, are saying, wait a minute, maybe we should be like a little bit more mindful of how we're doing our capitalism. Maybe we need to talk about a circular economy or even a regenerative economy. Wow. What if we could fix some of the things we have done wrong? And so when you find those 10 or 15 people in a corporation usually fighting against the odds, the question is, how do we give them a simple tool to think about the way they're moving and to help other people to come on board with them? And so my five questions really help to do that. It's And the words are smart. So the first question is, how are we contributing to a sustainable system by virtue of this policy or this program or this product that we are selling? How are, how are we doing that? And I think by taking the power out of this, the politicians who lead us are the leaders of our brave new world idea <laughs> and said, no, if enough of us Find who consider themselves leaders decide that I'm working on water, I'm going to use these same five questions. 
I am working on energy. I'm going to use these five questions. I'm working on justice systems. I'm going to use the same five questions. How is the justice system creating to, um, in this case, the sustainability is not sustainability of the prison system. It's very sustainable, right? Because certainly in America, we have a whole policy that feeds the prison pipeline, right? In this case, what's wrong with the prison system is that the end, the metric, is based on the assumption that we actually want to keep 33% of black males in prison. So that metric is not a moral metric, right? So how do you get people to change that metric? And so when the people who are now coming together to talk about defund the police, for example, what does that mean? How would you use my five questions then to think about what does it mean to defund the police, which really is about recalibrating the financing of the justice system and the school to prison pipeline so that we can get a better outcome and in fact reduce inequality in terms of the numbers of black people in prison versus numbers of white people in prison. So those are some of the questions that these simple questions help people to more quickly wrap their wrap their arms around so they can move forward as a collective in thinking in the same way. So what do I mean by that? You might say, think in the same way. We don't want to think the same way. Exactly. We don't want to think the same way. But if we ask the same question, right, whether I'm an engineer or you are a sociologist, if we're in the room talking about the same problem and we ask the same question of the problem situation, my argument is we're better able to see the different elements of this complex system which we have not been able to take care of because usually we are blindsided. It's just our point of view. And because I don't understand how sociologists think, I don't know what they're talking about. And the sociologists don't understand what engineers are talking about. So I'm saying let us use a simple set of questions that allow us to better able to um, speak to each other and have these strategic conversations about the future we want, the smart, flourishing future, which basically all, want, all people want to flourish. Dr. Nelson, I see one of your one of your questions here is um, you hint at racism and exclusion as being part of the reason for our current crisis. Talk a little bit about that. Well, um, when you look at the way in which, let's take at the global level, mineral ex- extraction from Africa, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Um. European countries have been quite happy to just extract the raw material, leave the 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 the, 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 the what they call the findings of the whether it's bauxite or cobalt or coal tunnel or whatever coal tunnel or whatever, leave the place kind of scarred and ravaged by their mining practices because they have not valued the space of let's say those African. Um, countries, those African villages, those African terrain that have been scarred by mining. Um, that's part of the racic, racism construct that has created the economy in which we live. Um, that dynamic plays out here in the U.S. as well. If you look at where certain, um, uh, let's say, the waste, solid waste systems are placed, where prison systems are built, where um, industrial um, factories are built, and typically those areas, the people who live around those areas are poorer, so therefore when they're spewing carbon in the air, the profit people are not going to say, okay, we're not going to really put money on to kind of scrub the air because who cares, those are just, you know, whatever, black people, they have no power anyway. So we don't have to pay extra to clean the air, whereas if it was a white neighborhood, they would clean the air. So some of the challenges we're facing, you know, health care, the challenges we're facing in terms of the inequity gap between countries and within countries is based on the construct of the value of a black life is less than the value of a white life. And I think you might find this when you look at, for example, I haven't done the research, but certainly I'd love to see somebody in the insurance industry, for example, challenge me on this and then do the research and come back and tell me what the number is. But I'm sure there's a number, a lifespan number, that people in the um, in 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 actuarial societies put on the value of the life of, say, a black person in America versus a black person in Nigeria, right? And so if you're to file a lawsuit, for example, that's the number they use 
to decide if you're pay if you be paid that amount. So those are the ways in which I think very subtle insidious ways that exist in a rule book that governs our system. And if we look at the global rule books, there have been very few majority black countries that have been at the table of the rule book making. So the G7 makes the rules about the economy and global security, the nuclear arms rules, for example. Then you have the G20. And even recently we've seen a conversation that the G20 is planning to have an agreement with Africa. And somebody posted in the same chat, well, why not have the G21? Why should Africa be not be at the table? Why you have to meet separately and then come and say, oh, okay, well, we're going to do this with you. So what we're saying is as we talk about this new economic world order, which is trying to be birthed, and I think COVID might be part of the, of, of the kind of spiritual spiritual incident. <laughs> it's a physical oh, incident, yeah. but it has a spiritual meaning. Yeah. And it's meant to have a stop. Everybody's in the same boat, right? And now we're all flung onto the ether, right? This energy space called the internet. And we now are getting comfortable with not traveling, but we have spent, many of us have spent the last year talking to people in Timbuktu, Poland, Australia. I mean, and all of a sudden we have these friends from all over the world. And we say, wait a minute, I have something in common with this person. I've never met them in physical, except virtual. And now we see, well, maybe, just maybe, but maybe COVID is a blessing in disguise. That if enough of us say, no, 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 let's not build back better because we don't want to build back with the same formula. We actually want to change the formula. So let us build forward to a flourishing future. That's the conversation I want to have. And that's why I'm so delighted to be have the opportunity to come and speak to your audience who don't know me from Adam. I don't know from Adam, but the point is maybe 10 people might say, hey, this one made some sense. I'm going to go get a book and have her come and talk to my school or my church or my youth group because at the end of the day, it will take 1 million of us believing in this because each of us, I believe, has influence over 150 people. So if I can get to 1 million people, I can actually reach 150 million people. So that's my crazy idea. And that's why I'm part of the series, because it was a crazy idea. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely reach, you, you, you definitely reaching a whole lot of people today, that's for sure. But uh, I, I just want to say today to uh, our listeners, we're talking to Dr. Claire Nelson, and the topic of the show is how to get smart. If you'd like to call in, the call in number is six four six two I'm sorry, six four six nine two nine twenty eight seventy. Press number one on your phone and we'll be glad to let you in and join the conversation. Don't be What's the number afraid. again? I'm gonna put it on my Facebook page. What's the number again? Six four six four six four six four six nine two nine two eight seven zero. Okay. Yeah, All right. You can call in and speak to Dr. Claire Nelson right now, and uh, we're speaking on her book, Smart Futures for a Flourishing World. Uh, Dr. Nelson, uh, tell me, and I'm sure our listeners want to know, what is Afro Futurism? Okay, so Afro Futurism is um, an arts movement. It's considered to be mostly a speculative arts movement that um, people of African descent have outpictured in visual arts, in literature, um, in story making about a future that is black centered or African centered. Um, so in a sense, I would not say that I'm an Afrofuturist from an artistic standpoint, but certainly the stories in the book might be considered Afrofuturist type of stories because they're very much centered in a black perspective of what the future should look like. Um, so separate from futurists like myself, we're also an engineer. We are also working on general issues like uh, energy futures. What should energy look like? How can we have countries and governments and companies reach our goals of decarbonization um, that we need to get to to kind of stop, the, the, well, reduce, I shouldn't say stop, to with, withdraw down on the, the pace of of climate change. Um, so futurists, Afrofuturists are not necessarily people who practice 
futures and strategic foresight in the way I do as a living consultant and speaker. But they're very important in how we storify the world we live, that narrative that they tell. And one of the things I've been really looking for and some of the people I'm talking to, we're looking for what we call near future, that means between now and 2040, speculative fiction that is not fantasy. Because if we can get enough black people writing about the future from a non-fantasy perspective, taking account what technology is doing now and how it's shaping out to be and what could be, then we can have some narrative that's hopefully not dystopian, that is what I call a normatopian view of how we're going to treat issue of AI in the next five years. It's moving so fast, right? How are we going to treat the issue of robotics and jobs being made into robots? Even China is testing robots and fast food factors. So if China perfects using robots in fast food um, restaurants, then what's going to happen in America when, you know, so many of our those jobs are held by people in low income. So all of these questions we have to be asking right now. What is the metric that makes us say it's okay for somebody to not have a job? Even though, yes, it might be a minimum wage job, but if it is a job, and let's talk about that wage, that wage needs to also go up. But what's the point of talking about a universal basic income to tell people to go home and sit down and do what? So humans are, yes, are not just their job. But for many people, their job gives them a sense of purpose, a sense of identity, gives them a sense of pride. And for people who hate their jobs, yes, they would love to be replaced by a robot so they can go off and do other things. But then are we preparing them, our, our young people, whether it's here or in Jamaica or in Nigeria, for um, the future that's coming if we choose to make the investment in technology the driving, let's say, driving force that we're tending to do right now. There's a whole sort of a glorification of technology. I said, oh, we're going to all be like transhumans. We're all going to be like augmented reality and that kind of consciousness. And I'm saying to myself, some of these people need to speak to people at my church who are already extra-conscious people. They're already talking to the stars because they're already groomed. They're already trained their mind to do that without being augmented. So this is tension we're going through right now, and I think, that even the book doesn't talk about that, but I'm saying that as someone who is also engaged in the spiritual community as a futurist and looking at the future of faith and the future of God, I'm looking at things like that in my other work, right? Then these conversations are things I have to be talking about now. You know what I see too, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Dr. Nelson, you're Jamaican, correct? Yes, I'm Jamaican. Okay, so you know where you come from. There's a lot of there's a yeah. lot of blacks here. I think they're struggling with their identities and and to me you would almost certainly have to kinda of know where you come from and where you are before you could even think about where you wanna go and where you wanna be. And I think a lot of yeah. blacks here are struggling with that identity thing, which is the foundation. I really, really, really want to talk to you about that conversation. But probably don't have enough time today. I have gotten into arguments with people about this conversation. Let me assure you, my brother, right, that as there are still pockets of people in Jamaica. Can you believe it? The country that gave birth to Marcus Garvey and Bob Marley, right? The country that gave birth to Rastafari that said, hey, there's a black person who is a direct descendant of the, you know, tribe of Judah, which is the same tribe that Jesus the Christ came from. In this country, there are people who bleach their skin. Okay, go figure. So I'm saying that to say, the Jamaicans you see at the table, like here, like myself, come out of a particular same mindset. Maybe our parents were different. They were, you know, the people who saw themselves, whose grandparents saw themselves, who whatever. And so that pocket of people at the base who have been continually oppressed, those people in Jamaica who are bleaching are the same probably category of people here in inner city, America, or deep rural south that have been continually oppressed and oppressed, who continually have people say to them, you will not amount to nothing, right? Who continually, that's, all, that's what the society throws at them. And yes, in Jamaica, there are individuals who throw that at certain people based on their address, 
right? So it's harder for them to get out of that unless they have a parent who is strong or, um, or a teacher or somebody. And so I would like for us here, as we look at the Black Futures perspective, which is something I'm also working on, is to say, okay, how do we really look back at the cause of why we have this feeling of being less than? How often have we been told we're less than? And in the case of, yes, we understand our African identity, but we're all, I consider people in the West, most of us are mixed tribe. We're not wholly African. We're mixed with Indian and, and Amer- Native American and Chinese and white. We, our tribe here is what I call the lost tribe of Africa, right? So we have to spend the spiritual work. And the work began, I think, with things like Kwanzaa and those things, but it needs to continue. We cannot stop with Kwanzaa and say, okay, we've done enough. But we haven't done enough. We have to go beyond that. Now, and now is the time. We should be using these two years or the three years of lockdown to have these introspective conversations. What does it mean to say I come from Chicago if, in fact, my grandparents were slaves in Mississippi? And why can't I find pride in that? They survived. <laughs> they survived. And they struck out in the brave unknown, the great migration, looking for a better life. Their future that they saw was in the north. And then they realized when they got there that some of them were not going to make it. They tried, but the system, the policies of the system were set up for repeating failure. I found out in Southern Jamaican history, when, they, when Jamaica and, the, and Trinidad and those countries reinstit, reinstated emancipation there, did a lot of research, and I found out to my horror, I wasn't taught this in high school, right, that right after emancipation in Jamaica and the Caribbean, the system was set up to disenfranchise the free blacks from getting anything. So they set up taxes on donkeys and mules, which is all black people had which were higher than the taxes on horses, which the white planters have. I tell you, okay? So, so, when, so when you talk about inequality and reparations and all these things, we have to go back and deconstruct the rule book. And so, okay, <laughs> the rule book was set up for this of a failure. So now we're now able to see we're entering an era of transparency, if we are careful to ensure that we are digitally literate and media literate to understand what we're looking at, who is the person behind this piece of data, and how did it arrive at this number? I'm so sorry for kids born today. They have so much to learn. They got so we so need much to find to so much so to learn much because to- I'm... They got so much to learn, but they living with this ball of confusion because, like I say a lot of times, the same person that created the game also made the rules, and that's what we're fighting to change, and that's what you're talking about. You know, the the blueprint from earlier on is what have this crisis, you know, and what I was mentioning a minute ago, like a lot of American blacks, don't they, they really don't know who they are. You know, they, they don't. They don't know who they are as a people. You know, I mean, we talk about, you know, the Chinese can go to China, uh, the Japanese can go to Japan, you know, the Europeans can go to Europe, the Mexicans can go to Mexico, but uh, a lot of us American blacks, you know, they say you're African-American, but I've never been to Africa. My parents have never been to Africa. Their parents have never been to Africa. So why I just can't be black American? Well, here's the question, right? And it's a conversation that we really have to have now that the reparations conversation is also on the table. Um, oh, one, more thing I want to to... Up, one, more, one more thing, one more thing. All these, country, all these states around the country that's trying to take American history out of school, and I'm going to try to figure out why you don't want the truth to be told to the youngsters of today. And I know I didn't learn anything about black history uh, and I'm sorry, we're gonna get back on your book. But I didn't learn anything about Black history until I was out of, till I was out of high school. I wasn't taught any of that. I was just taught about Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. You know what I mean? So and now they're trying to take 
uh, all black education, the black history out of schools. And I'm trying to figure out why. I mean, why? You want to why? talk about World War Two and, and Pearl Harbor and everything else, so why you don't want to talk about that? Because uh, people without a knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. And so this is an attempt to cut off any attempt for self empowerment, right? The thing is that um, the teaching of history in our schools, I think, is not just about teaching black people black history. It's about teaching white people black history. It's about teaching all Americans the real history of the indigenous people of this country or the history of slavery or the issue of the Chinese railroad workers that were brought in as indentured workers back in the home century. So there's a lot of history that's not taught about how America became this wealthy giant that it is. And not to take away from what is good about America in the sense that I like to tell people, and the reason why I became a Caribbean activist and a Caribbean advocate was I thought, well, okay, we're here. Why are we all coming here? We're all coming here because we believe in this concept which was sold to us, that, you know, okay, freedom, independence, life and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right, we can come here. No matter how poor you are, you can make something of yourself. Lo and behold, when you come here, you find it's not as easy as it's made to be in the movies, but still you can. If you believe in yourself and you just keep your head down, you can do it. So we do it. However, for the, 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 the let's say, the African-American descendants of slavery, and this is why we have this growing, let's say, divide and irritation of, you know, who is the right black to speak for African-Americans, etc. And I'm like, yes, I see the point, but let's not divide and conquer so quickly. When you think about it from the point of view of those of us from the West, the Americas, the blacks from Brazil, the blacks from Jamaica, we are saying we're all were enslaved people, right? Nigerian Ghana then say, well, we were not enslaved, but we were colonized. And then there's this big toss about, okay, well, you sold us, who didn't sell us, etc. All of this fight is going on in the internal black community. But we're all here living as blacks in America, in a society and in a group which is set up to be more or less um, against the against the system. I mean, against our well-being. So taking history out would be do a great damage to us, but I think would even do a greater damage to the white majority who needs to understand the world into which we're going. In our new world order, you see how fast China and India are moving, right? China plans to be on the moon the same time as America. India is doing nuclear testing. Pakistan, I think, is doing nuclear testing. So who is going to be left behind other than people of African descent, at the rate of which we're going? So we need to be not waiting on the school system to teach us. We need to have our churches engaged in teaching black history. So do not wait until it is done unto you. Learn the lessons from Gavi and the people from our heroes who, in the case of Jamaica, we have heroes that were executed for uprisings, right? Lots of slave uprisings were done in the Caribbean region. And even Barbados to have a slave, slave uprising. The guy was roasted alive for the slave uprising, right? So we, so we, have, we have these ancestors of ours that said, well, okay, if they were able to try we can at least try to do what we can. So use the spaces we do have. Use our churches, our professional clubs, our Jack and Jill clubs, etc., to do the work to teach ourselves. And if we have allies from the white community who say, hey, can you come and talk to my people about my students in the Jewish club or the, you know, whatever club about black history, don't say, it's not my job to teach you. Go learn yourself. What's, what's the point of that attitude? No point. I mean, I, I think I think that's I think we're we're being sort of a snarky, and I understand if you're tired of being the only black in the room. I've been the only black in the room most of my life in engineering, for example. But at some point, if somebody asks you, you can sense when they're being snarky and when they really want to know. And if somebody comes to you with an energy that tells you they really just really want to know and they really want to do better or try to understand why things are the way they are, I think we have to recognize that part of our gift, those of us who have the privilege of having gone to university and are able to be the only person in the room in the engineering fraternity or the accounting fraternity or the corporate whatever, C-suite, 
is to say, well, I may not be able to talk about it right now, but here's what. Here's a book you can read. And here's an organization you can go to, and I will go with you if you'd like. I mean, find a way if you don't want to deal with it yourself because it's too much stress. It's not your job. I agree. But to just kind of put the block, I think, is doing a disservice if we're trying to say, how do we have these strategic conversations to the future we want? So the question about history is not irrelevant to the book about the future. I start the book in the history exactly for that reason. How can we build a future if we don't know where we're coming from? Right. That is so true. That is so true. Yeah. Marcus Garvey, right? (laughs) And so I think as we watch the noise about critical race theory versus history, all of a sudden everything is conflated into critical race race theory. Every single data point in history is now a critical race theory issue. So totally um, overblown, right? But those of us who are wise have to watch and say, okay, I see what's going on. So let me have my plan B, my plan C, and my plan D in place, and let me find allies where I can to ensure that if this is how it's going to play out, we have a plan C and a plan D to fall back on. I'm going to the moon with you. Ah, exactly. I hope you are. (laughs) Yay. Moon runnings. That group is called the Upstarts. United Planter Society to assure the rights to space. <laughs> yeah, boy, you, I know you're going to have them going. So let me ask you a question in uh, regards to your book, uh, Dr. Nelson. Yes. Why, why, did you, why did you include uh, mythology? Ah, all right. So for your listeners, mythology is a big part of my book. I start with a great global planter and myth where Anansi, my personal hero, takes center stage, right? And I wanted to start there because so much of what we are experiencing is built on the European mythology, right? Um, the Latin words we use, the Greek, etc. everything that we are, those of us who are embedded in this world, because European, let's say, knowledge systems have become have been dominant in the last 500 years a lot of what we that undergirds the way we are taught is based on these mythologies and when i was doing anti-racism work at the idb uh, i was vilified a lot so i had to try to find a way to okay tone it down and i thought you know what i'm gonna well i didn't think i think god told me um you need to kind of blend your stories telling self because people like that part of you you know you make people laugh and you sing and people feel good all right so i said okay they want to see this angry black woman let me find a way to enter the space differently so i started doing research on mythologies about how we were created as humans and most mythological stories have the god of that tribe on creating that tribe right i only found one story where the God created people of different colors and placed them all around the world. And that was a Inca mythology um, about their, their, their creator God, Viracocha. And so ever since I found it, I've been fascinated by, wow, if at the core of our societies, we were told that everybody that doesn't look like us is an other and ought to be feared and is dangerous and ought not to be trusted, and that that's their core, 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 core meme of ourselves as a humanity. How do we get to shift that now that we're a planetary species, we've gone to the moon, we see that we're one planet without borders, but we're still operating from this old mythology. So my great dream is to create a mythology that is a planetary mythology. And so this is why I put in the book a planetary mythology where all the gods come together. The Norse god of chaos, Zeus, um, Nyame from the Ashante, you know, this one from the Peru, the Inca, all the gods come together to discuss the human problem. And my, it's a tongue in cheek story. Yes, it's meant to be humorous. Obviously, it's a mythology story which I've made up. But I really wanted to think wait a minute. If these stories are the formation of our creation mythologies, uh, you know, Egyptian gods, uh, Sumerian gods, Indian gods, Shiva, all these people. Uh, what if they really were actually having these conversations about these things that they have created, carrying on as if to say, you know, they're all that and about to self-destruct the earth? 
And so that's where the, the book starts with this mythology and why I've chosen mythology, because I believe for the causal paradigm shift that we're talking about, we've got to look at the different layers. So it's not just the litany of the news, but it's the base, the core of how we see ourselves as the human species. The fact we actually have races, which was defined by, you know, somebody 500 years ago. But before that, before there were races, there were different clans and tribes, right, that had different belief systems. And they had markings so we could know who is who. And we had tattoos and scarification, all these things. But it's still deep embedded in our mindset that these differences exist. So we have to start creating these global planetary stories that show us working together with the intention of thriving in a very um, potentially precarious future that is lining up if we don't take care of climate, plastics, water, energy, and all of these things that are now at the borderline of, of, of carrying us to the road of self-extinction. Yes, and um, we need to get on top of that stuff today. Today, and I really feel as if as one of the few black women that are working um, in the future space at this level, um, thinking about the fact that when you look at, they say, the World Economic Forum, it's the same traditional people who are there meeting to talk about the future of the world. Um, they're the ones writing the books. They're the ones that get the coverage in the media. They're the ones that get quoted. And I'm saying, but what about the rest of us? We're not here just sitting on a top level waiting to be done onto, part of our shared future is how we share decision making. It's not enough to say we share the planet. It's not enough to say we share our humanity. It's not enough to say we share the rule book because in each of those cases, the rule book is, de is designed without most African and Caribbean and Pacific nations and Asian nations being at the table. So people of color in general were not the table when those rules were being made. My fourth question is, how are we going to share decision-making? Who gets to sit at the table? How do we balance between AI-enabled decision-making and human decision-making as we have to address more and more complex questions? And who gets to decide that number? Are we going to be at the table, people from African countries, people from Pacific nations that are so tiny, but the vast ocean that is there, so to speak, they have no clue because they don't have satellites. They don't know who's out there fishing in their waters. I mean, it's, it's really a very, what is it, complex conundrum in which we find ourselves. And so I really hope that this book, allows us to find ourselves, find those of us who have been having these questions, especially those of us who are from small um, communities that don't, have an, don't seem to have any power. And I'm saying, yeah, but we do have power if we come together differently and see ourselves as one, even though we're in our separate projects and our separate processes and our separate um, you know, movements. If we just think of ourselves, listen, we all want the same thing, smart futures. And here's the five questions I'm going to ask every time I go to uh, a designer for policy or a product or whatever table that I find myself. And that's what I'm hoping that this book can do, help us have this conversation, these strategic conversations about the future. And that's why the stories are in there, because the stories I'm hoping will spark, ah, oh, what if this could really happen, and spark interest in, in, in these ideas of how the world might shape up. My stories start from 3000 and end at the year 2030. 3,000 and end 2030? Yes. I go backwards in time. Okay. And, you know, uh, people ask, I know why, and I'm going to tell you quickly why I don't know run out of time. Why I did that? Because at first I was only going to go up until like around 2070, because 2070 is the 100th anniversary of World Earth Day, right? And I thought like 2070, but well, the people who are born will only be 50. That's young. By 2070, if we're still alive, we've not killed off ourselves, the lifespan is going to probably be about 110 for some people because, you know, we have life extension, human augmentation, et cetera. So people are living to 110 easily. So 50 is too young to stop. So it's okay, I'm going to go to 2100. I said, what? Well, again, does that imply that the world will end at that time? I said, no, I don't want people to think that. I said, okay, let me go to the next millennia. 
Because if we think about it, the archaeologists today are excavating ruins from, you know, 5,000 B.C. and 7,000 B.C., right? And I'm imagining the people who are going to be around in 3,000 A.C.E., 1,000 years from now, or the year 5,000 years from now, um, what will they find? Will we have self-destructed? Or will we have saved ourselves in some way, some form or fashion? If a meteorite doesn't hit us or if a solar flare doesn't hit us, how are, how are we going to evolve? And so I wanted to put that story of the year 3000 there, where we are a space-faring species. We're now occupying other planets. And uh, the story is about the ambassador that is traveling in between planets. find out about the rest of that one. So, uh, Dr. Nelson, <laughs> tell them where they can go pick up your book. Well, my book is on Amazon. Um, I think you can also get it on Barnes and & Noble and other bookstores, but Amazon, everybody is familiar with Amazon. So if you just Google Smart Futures, probably the book will come up because I realize that I don't think any other book starts with those names. Uh, I was lucky enough to um, come up with that first title. So Smart Futures for Flourishing World on Amazon. And I'm really looking forward to some of you purchasing the book. And if you're a member of a book club, please, I'm happy to have this discussion with your book club. As I said, I'm trying to not just sell books. I'm trying to create flag bearers for the Smart Futures movement. It's really going to take a million of us to be talking about this across the world and here in the U.S., in the Caribbean, in Africa, wherever you're listening to the sound of my voice, to sort of say, you know what, I have been thinking about these things for a long time, and this is not so hard. And um, I really hope that, you know, I hear from some of your listeners um, that, yes, I heard you on the show, I bought the book, and I'd love for you to come and talk to my church or my school or my book club. And actually, and for those that joined the show late, it would be, you know, it'll be available worldwide in a couple of minutes, so you won't have no reason not to hear everything you need to hear. And hopefully you can reach out to Dr. Nelson. And uh, we're going to continue to support you from our show. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk about this from your perspective. And as I said, we may have to have another conversation offline about some of the issues you raised <laughs> because I'm you know passionate what? about was, these issues. I, I was thinking the same thing. We're going to have to have another conversation because People still need to know where they come from so they'll know where they are so they can hope to know where they're going to go. Yes, 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 yes. And, you know, just a little plug for what we're doing on um, Tuesday. As I said, Tuesday is UN International People of African Descent Day, and we're going to be live on Facebook on, on, on the Institute of Caribbean Studies Facebook page. So please, if you um, dig around and find it, join us there. Um, talking about Darwinomics and what it means to be African descent for the future. How do we create economic empowerment? And this is about building out ideas I've been working on for years, and I just couldn't let the day go by. I couldn't let it go by. I thought about it, but I said, let me call some friends and have this conversation. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for coming to join us. We definitely appreciate you. Well, everybody, Dr. Claire Nelson. Go pick up a book. Great, great information for you. And that's about all the time for us. We'll be back next week, same time, 2.30. And also I want to give a quick shout-out to uh, Mr. Tim Ward, uh, resetting our future series. Uh, A lot of great information about climate control and the world in which we live in, so go support. Uh, You'll definitely enjoy the read. So, guys, see you next week. Can I play a play? Worldmovement.com. We appreciate you for coming and take time and listen to our show. And be safe out there and be caring and loving in all that you do. See you next week. I'm getting to the point now when I get to church. I want to ask somebody, did you mess up before you got saved? So they can say, yes. I say, you're the one I want to sit with. Because I know you won't praise the Lord. I don't want to sit with no dude who shoes. Who feels like I don't need to lift him up tonight. Well, why you sitting there like you did or so? You got your brain so built. You ought to be jumping, jumping, shouting and running in. On your feet for the second come in. Miss me with that attitude sweet. You want me to be cool, but I ain't because I can't. Because if you only know what he's done for me. The things